us this morning as we start worship, worshiping the Lord God, our King. And this morning, I'm, we're starting with a new chorus. So we're going to sing the first verse and chorus, and then we're going to go back and do the first verse and chorus again. It's very easy and simple. You'll recognize the scripture that it goes along with this morning. Here we go. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, with all your heart. Go ahead and be seated for a moment. I want to welcome you all here this morning. I'm Pastor Roy Gearhart, and if you're a guest in particular, I want to say welcome and thank you for joining us today. Uh, we are uh, this morning uh, just we're going to be celebrating Holy Communion today, and so I just mentioned to you that you should have, on your way in, received your little cup with bread and juice. And uh, just as I had mentioned to you uh, last month, uh, just Take a peek at it when you get it. Make sure that you haven't had any cross leakage. Occasionally we get one that the juice sneaks its way through to the bread and then it gets a little bit funky and it's like, mm, that's not going to work. So just check that out and be sure that uh, yours is good to go. And uh, later on then you'll be set. Um, as, uh, uh, and this morning as we are um, uh, checking in, oh, as we're starting into the new month, uh, just wanted to mention, too, that we are starting a new One Thing project, and this month it's the uh, 
Salvation Army, and uh, we've uh, shared a long connection with the ministry of Salvation Army here in Franklin, uh, making meals on Mondays, and uh, so that Salvation Army does two things with food. They give out food to individuals and families, but they also do meals uh, throughout the week. There are several days that they do meals, and uh, that's the thing that we focus most of our attention on supporting, is trying to bring in some food products that will help them with uh, those meals. There are also folks from here that volunteer on Mondays generally and, uh, and uh, go down and help uh, make uh, meals. Uh, Darlene over here in the middle is uh, one of the goers on that. She'd be glad to link arms with you, take you down there, show you the ropes sometimes. Yeah, and Hazel and Diane are busy, busy bees on that, uh, both on Mondays and Thursdays. Stand up, Darlene, and holler at them. Yeah. All right, as I said, we can hook you up with uh, going down to serve with Darlene, and those who might not have heard all of it, 30, 35 to 60, sometimes as high as 60 people being served through drive-in, uh, takeout you know, meals and everything. So as I was saying then, we focus our attention on trying to provide things for uh, prepping those meals. And so we've given you a shopping list and encourage you to, uh, it, it, this is just a sampling of things you could get. You don't have to go and get every single thing on the list. You can get a whole bunch of one thing or another. But this gives you an idea of the things needed. And we encourage you to buy them in large containers. Because you can imagine if you're getting a meal ready to serve 60 people, and if you have to open... Uh, a, a bunch of those little cans of soup, you know, to serve them, your arm's going to fall off, you know, before you're done. So, you, you know what I'm saying? We can, we encourage you to get those bulk items, uh, you know, larger cans if possible, so that we can share with them. So, those are, this gives you something handy you can, uh, you know, take along with you on your shopping trips and uh, be able to uh, help out with that ministry. All right, uh, we've got... Uh, We've got a couple of, uh, just a couple of quick, quick prayer notes to remember as well. I um, uh, wanted to note to you, uh, Dan Havis, uh, that many of you have been where he's been going through a, 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 a very challenging uh, cancer treatment, and he finished his series of treatments, and uh, so he and Sandy were off to Florida. So that's, he had to hang around this winter instead of being able to go down there. Also, I was asked to mention uh, Katie Heckathorn is uh, moving in from hospital care to transitional care in the hospital and uh, is making uh, some progress after her heart treatment and uh, was asked that I'd share that with you as many of you know these folks and need to uh, lift them up in pr prayer this morning. Well, let's uh, take a moment and uh, turn to the Lord in prayer uh, before we continue on in worship this morning. Dear Lord, we thank you for your blessings today. We thank you, God, for your presence in our life. Dear Lord, as we go through the winter months, the, the overcast skies, the dreariness of the weather, the bitterness of the cold, it becomes physically wearing to us, and mentally and spiritually as well, we are worn down by some of those life experiences. And so, God, whenever the sun pops out, it is uh, such a lift to us physically, mentally, all the way around. But God, we need to always be looking for that moment when you pop up in our lives, when you rise and, and like a light piercing through the overcast sky, you come shining through in our lives. And we realize that you are with us, that, we, that, that the days that we spent worrying and fretting were really not worth it, that we needed to hold on to a trust and a hope in you. And so, God, I pray that on those sunshine days that you bring in our soul, that you would build us up with a strength, a determination, a confidence, God, in you, 
that would be sustaining even whenever we're running under cloud cover so that, God, your light would shine in us each and every day and that we would be a light even in this world around us. We pray in the name and the power of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand together and worship. It's just awesome. Isn't it awesome that we know that God is with us, that he watches over us, he's with us, he loves us, he is for us. That's just awesome. That means then whatever's going on, we can trust him, we can lean on him, we can believe and know that he has our best.
You may be seated. This morning we'll get into uh, the scripture in, uh, in, the, in Exodus, we'll be in chapter 16 primarily, uh, we'll pick up a few verses in chapter 17 as well, and uh, we're going to also touch base in the New Testament today in 1 Corinthians 10 and in the Gospel of John chapter 6. These all intertwine, they actually connect back and forth, the, you know, sometimes when we get to the New Testament, there are references back to something that happened that was described in the Old Testament. Sometimes it's uh, relating to the promises of God there. Sometimes we're looking back upon those things as examples and instructional material. And that's a, a chunk of what that is today. There's also a moment in the sixth chapter of John where there's a looking back uh, through the uh, words of uh, people who wanted a sign from Jesus. And what, what we're going to see challenged in us uh, this morning is the, whether or not people are altogether in or not, whether they are committed for the full journey or whether they are just along for the ride. And it shows itself in many cases in what we see turn out as grumbling that is voiced by the people, and this grumbling will we'll distinguish them as people who are not always altogether in. They're not altogether committed. And it uh, means that they, they kind of tentatively go along, and then when things get bad, they kind of break off and are ready to go all the way back in retreat or to wipe out the leaders and get someone new to take over. It's that kind of tentative commitment that doesn't allow them to go all the way in in their heart and mind with the Lord. And it robs them of an awful lot of the blessing of God in their own hearts. Even though God is there offering it up, they miss out on a great deal of it. We're going to see that today in these scriptures. You know, some 30 years ago, I went on a mission trip to Kenya, Africa. And uh, Kenya is on the eastern side of Africa, down under the hump. And uh, I, I was blessed uh, just soon after I got out of high school to go on a mission trip there with missionaries that were part of uh, World Gospel Mission and spent uh, close to three weeks there. And uh, one of the interesting things that that I learned whenever I was there from one of the missionaries was that he had spent time out in uh, the countryside with uh, different uh, tribal groups in Kenya. And uh, one, of, uh, one of these groups of, uh, uh, of Kenyans that he had come to have a, a strong acquaintance with, he, had, he spent some time uh, talking to them about their history where they had come from, what their origins were, those kinds of stories. And uh, uh, their, their story was preserved as an oral history. It was something that was just passed down by word of mouth from one generation to another, and for the most part not written down. And that's in fact the way that the Bible in its earliest time was passed along, was not written down, but much of it passed along in the earliest days by word of mouth and with this uh, care to pass along this message over and over again. And the missionary talking with this uh, group of uh, tribal leaders asked them, well, where did you come from? What was the story that your fathers and grandfathers told you? And they said, well, we, we uh, came to Kenya from a place, uh, where, and they described the terrain, and he realized right away that it's like, well, that's, that's north of here, uh, is that part of the area. And they said, and as they kept telling the story, they said, well, and our fathers told us that before that, that our grandfathers, great-grandfathers, whatever, they had come through a terrain like this and, and migrating to the, where they were in Kenya. And it, it, it was obvious they were describing 
a migration that was coming from further north in Africa, and, and each, each description of a region was, was clearly uh, following the, the geography of Africa. And as the story kept going on, they finally they said, and there was a time when their forefathers had come out from Egypt with a leader named Moshe. Well, Moshe is the way that you say Moses in Hebrew. And, and it's original expression. So that these people were tracing their story back through the oral history that had been given to them by their grandfathers uh, that said that they had come from North Africa, from in fact, from up in Egypt, and they had had a leader named Moshe. It was like, wow, that's pretty doggone interesting, isn't it? And it, and it fits, though, with what the Bible tells us, is that when the people came out of Egypt, there were not just the Hebrew people, but there were others who came along with them. That their move to freedom brought others out from freedom. But we also then realize from that that not everyone was fully on board. And not everyone then was making the full journey. Some fell away in one direction or another. And we see that even amongst those who were on the road back to the promised land as descendants of Abraham, well, ultimately, they didn't make it either. That we realize that, that whenever the people left, that there were those who went out, followed all the way through the Red Sea, on down the road to the mountain with the Ten Commandments given, all of these things that they journeyed through, seeing all of these things happen, but then didn't make it. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 5. It says, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food, drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that, was, that accompanied them. And that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with them, with most of them, and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. There were those that they went out on the trip. They left Egypt and went with Moses. They went down the road, on, even with the full intention of going to the promised land, and yet we know that there was a generation that did not make it there. And what we see is that God was working with them from the very beginning to try to bring them on board in a way that they would actually follow the Lord and be obedient and listen to Him. But instead, they kept falling away. They kept pulling back. They kept ignoring His instruction. They kept coming back again and again, grumbling before God with complaints that said, well, we're just ready to go back to Egypt. We're done with it. We're not, we don't want to follow along this road. It's difficult. And they kept wanting to check out. Go back to Exodus with me, and you find it in Exodus 16, verses 2 to 4, that it says, in the desert, it's after the Red Sea, or out in the desert, the whole company grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but you have brought us into the desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day, and in this way I will test, or excuse me, wait, wait, I think I skipped something. Yes, yes, I'm sorry, I jumped, I jumped something. Uh, no, 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 okay, I am all right. I'm just, <laughs> sorry about that. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you and the people are to go out and uh, gather enough for that day and in this way I will test them to see whether they will follow my instructions. I was just getting ahead of myself in my head. The, uh, <laughs> the, 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 Lord, the Lord is encountering them as they're going out the road and listen to the manner of their grumbling. This is not just presenting your need before God with a confidence that God has an answer. This is not that kind of presentation. That's, this is not the way that we should pro approach God in prayer. This is not the, the way in which in, in, our, in faith we would really seek after God. If, if we're there in faith, we don't come grumbling. 
This grumbling is a whole other matter. They are coming before God grumbling, not coming to present their needs in faith and saying, oh, dear God, we're having a hard time and we, we are confident, though, that you have an answer or that you're going to help us. No, they come with a grumbling that says, we'd have been better off if we'd have just died in Egypt. It's like, it's like they are out there on the road, but it's like a, with a wait-and-see attitude all the time. It's like, we're, we're going with you, but we're really not that sure about you. They're not that sure about Moses' leadership. They're not that sure about God's providence. They're just not that sure about it. And so every time you turn around with them, they're like ready to just bail and go right back to Egypt. This is why the Lord brought them through the Red Sea instead of taking them up. Remember, whenever they left Egypt, they didn't go up the main highway right up along the coastline because the Lord said if they run into trouble there, they'll turn around and go straight back down the road and be back in Egypt. The Lord said, I'm going to take them out this way, and he brought them through the Red Sea, and when he closed the door behind them, it was not only closing off that door from Pharaoh's pursuit, it was closing a door for them so that they wouldn't just keep falling back. But you can see that in their heads, they're still not all there. In their hearts, they're still not really committed fully to this journey of following the Lord. There's still this tentativeness that says, Maybe we would have been better off back in Egypt. Maybe we'd be better off now if we were back in Egypt. Because there we had lots to eat. There we didn't have all these kinds of problems. And how they've forgotten the problems that they were living in and now have decided that those weren't as bad as what they're dealing with now. Do you see the tentativeness with which they're following God? The uncertainty of whether or not he's going to lead them in a path that is good for them. As the chapter unfolds, in fact, uh, the Lord does provide for them. And this is a great witness to you and me, is that, is that God is faithful even when we're not. God is faithful even when we're not, because God is trying to reach us and draw us into a walk with him where we can live by faith, and where we can live in hope, and have a confidence in him, so that we could be at peace. God is seeking to bring us into that. And so he persists in it even when we are foolish and reckless. The Lord provided for the people. It says in the 13th verse of Exodus 16 that evening came and quail were blown into this camp in a way that they, they end up with quail just covering the ground. It's like they have happened into the middle of a migration or something. You know, it's like, how does this happen? Who can explain it all? But boom, there they are. They are inundated with quail. So all of a sudden, the grumblers are being fed to the fullest. And then the Lord tells them, in the morning, you're going to have bread. And this is the beginning of manna. Manna is given to his people uh, come the next morning. It's like there's a heavy dew, and when it sheds off, there are all these flakes laying around. It's like they've got cornflakes laying on the ground, ready for them to pick up. And, and they pick them up and are able to eat. But this all comes with, uh, also with some caveats, some instructions that go with it. You remember that it says that they are to go out and gather an omar, which some translations will just say a quart per person of this manna whenever they go out that next morning. They're to gather up that much per person that in, their, in their residence. And that'll be enough. In fact, it emphasizes that whether they have gathered up a whole lot or they only gathered up a little, what they had was enough. It was enough. They were, every single person, whether they needed a little or needed a lot to feed their family, there was enough. Can you imagine what an abundance that is that they could go out and just gather this up and be fed the way that they were? And so God provides for them. He's feeding them uh, with this. But then, of course, the Lord said to them, I want you to gather up that much uh, per person, it'll be enough, but, and I don't want you to try to keep any over to the next day. Don't gather up any more than that. Don't try to save it up, except on the sixth day. Except on the sixth day, they were, they were given the invitation to gather twice as much as all the other days, so that on Sabbath, they wouldn't have to gather any. They would have a day of rest. And the Lord gives them these instructions, these caveats to his blessing so that he could 
test them. He, he challenges them to actually trust him. And so that instead of saying, well, gee, we've got, we've got this today, we better gather a whole bunch and save it up for tomorrow. The Lord says, no, I want you to count on me. You know, this is a way that I have found God's prov providing in life most of the time. In fact, I remember some years back when Janice and I were traveling in ministry writing an article about uh, kind of manna living and kind of having to live in a manna kind of state of mind. So you and I, we, we, God doesn't usually just come along and say, here, I'm going to fund you uh, for the rest of your life. Let me just dump this all in your lap and you're fully funded for the rest of your life. You never have to do it. God doesn't do that most of the time, does he? Overwhelmingly, God leads us along in life where every day you have to get up and trust God, where every day you have to take the next step, step of faith. Janice and I have learned this and lived this, sometimes with a little grumbling, I will confess, but nonetheless have learned this and lived this, it seems, our whole life. You know, everyone has their starting off in life story. You know, whenever you get married and you start off in life and, you know, living with all the hand-me-down furniture and living even in your parents' house or, you know, crazy things like that. And, and the hard times that many of us go through in our lives. And Janice and I have those kinds of stories. And God has blessed us and cared for us from the get-go. I mean, for heaven's sake, God has provided for us so many different ways from the time that we first got married. We were planning on living in my parents' basement and a man in the church in fact, the same man who helped send me on that mission trip that I told you about offered us to live in a trailer that he had in his little trailer court that he rented out trailers. We ended up living there uh, under that uh, care and blessing for, for uh, the years that I was finishing college, and we had our first daughter there. When Janice and I moved off to, uh, off to Kentucky for uh, me to go to seminary, um, we moved in kind of a crazy leap of faith. I had never visited Asbury Seminary where, that I attended. I had read about it, heard about it, knew that God was leading us to go there. And so the day that we pulled in with a, you know, a van full of, and a trailer full of stuff and a car stuffed to the gills uh, with our one-year-old in tow was the first day that we ever saw the place. And when we moved into the student housing that we were in there, it was this uh, wonderful uh, duplex, uh, all cement block, interior, exterior walls were all cement block. And uh, as we lived there, I came to believe that that was the absolute best option because I saw houses, uh, uh, I saw uh, student housing that had drywall on the walls and, and uh, I thought, I think our cement blocks stand up pretty well. And... Uh, Janice was recently talking about some of those days, some of those days whenever we would be literally pulling the change out of our, anywhere we could find it, out of the couch or wherever, and counting uh, our change to see if we had enough to be able to go down and pick up some bread and some cheese or hot dogs and, and uh, have uh, some, some food to go on. Um, we had uh, times whenever, uh, you know, folks from back home people from my home church, people from the churches that I had served uh, on Janice's home charge. There were people that would help us out. You know, some people, uh, it was every month they would send a little something. Some people, it was every now and then, you know, they'd send us a check. Might get a check in the mail for 20 bucks from somebody. And uh, there were so many times Janice was reminiscing about the Lord's providing where we would be like, wow, we're broke. What are we going to do? And you'd open up the mail, and there would be, you know, just another 20 bucks to get you on through. And we, uh, we, we had lots of times like that where God provided, you know, just step by step and bit by bit. Whenever I got out of seminary and we started in pastoral ministry, you know, I thought, man, I got a regular job now. We're rolling in it. <laughs> that was kind of funny. And... Uh, <laughs> you know, we still had to discover that we were dependent on God. And, uh, and, and there was something that God had caused a 
grow in us and blossom in us that when, uh, when the Lord opened the door for us to start traveling in ministry, you know, because I told you, we, we uh, traveled in ministry as an evangelist for 17 years. When we set off into that, um, there were lots of people that were like, um, you know, kind of aghast at the idea of just going off and depending on God to provide. And uh, through those years, uh, you know, there was uh, money that we received because, you know, wherever I preached at a church, they'd take up an offering or, you know, they'd have some amount they had decided on committing to and they would, you know, give some money to pay us to go, uh, pay us to be there and that kind of thing. But in reality, that didn't actually cover all the costs and didn't actually fund everything. We had to have people that supported us like missionaries. And so that we counted actually ultimately on about half of our income being from people who helped us to actually go at it. The point of all that is, is that um, we, we found that God was faithful and amazingly so over those years. And many, many times over that we went through lean times as well as the times of abundance and where God provided in both of those seasons. And people would talk about us like we were people that lived by faith. You know, you live by faith because you were out there trusting God to provide like that. But you know what I came to realize very, very clearly over the years was this, that if you think that just because you have a job and you're working that job that you're taking care of yourself and you just need God to kind of hang around and lend you a hand now and then, you're, you're really silly. You don't have a real clear picture of life. Uh, I, I've come to realize intensely that whether you live waiting for a check to come in the mail as an offering for service and ministry or whether you are getting up and going to work for a, at a job, that you and I need to be people who live by faith, who live with a confidence that it's God who is our provider and that we learn to buy in entirely to what God is doing in our lives so that when the lean times come, we don't get like these people and turn into grumblers who just throw our hands up and say, I just don't know what the point is of following God if I'm going to go through lean times like this. Or I don't know what the point is of trusting God if he's not going to be there the way that I need him this week. And the, there's, there's a sense in which many of us travel along the road not really fully bought in not fully bought into the idea that it's God who is our provider and our keeper, that it's God who sustains us and who carries us along. Those years that we spent on the road helped reinforce that in our lives and teach us that very clearly. But even though I'm here and I have a great job working here as the pastor of the church and everything, I haven't lost that sense of that, of that reliance upon God and that acknowledgement in my life that whatever I do, I need to do it in obedience to Christ. I need to follow him and let him lead my life and shape my life. It's that reason that Janice and I came here in the first place, leaving the ministry that we were doing those 17 years, and we came here. Why? It's the same leap of faith that we made when we left pastoral ministry and went into that. God was leading us. God was giving us a vision and a heart for that, and so we did it. And you and I need to have that kind of willful commitment to God that says, I'm ready, God. I'm ready to follow you. I'm ready to follow you wherever you want to lead me in my life. I'm ready to let you reshape my life. And then whenever you lose a job or you have, and you have to go get another one, or when you go through an illness, or you go through a lean time in your life, and you go through struggles, you know the one that you have been relying upon the whole time, the one that you're completely committed to. The one that you're un, un, unflinchingly trusting to lead you each and every step along the way because you've put your life into his hands like that. And so the, the point that I'm trying to bring across to you today is not to look at us like when we were traveling on the road like, wow, you're really people who live by faith. No, every day we need live by faith. Every day in that walk with God, every day in that commitment, every day along the way so that we are fully bought in, not kind of tentatively committed like we see the people of Israel here. Not kind of like, well, if it's going good, I'm in. But if it's not going well, then I'm not so sure. 
And maybe it's time for me to rethink this. You, you follow me? There's, there's, this, there's this ability of God to really work in our lives. And the people of God, they, man, they struggle with this. And sometimes we struggle. We truly do. And the people of God here, in the, we can't even get out of the 16th chapter without them breaking down and griping again. You know, that they're going to not only go through this episode of being without meat and bread, but next thing you know, well, hey, now we don't have water to wash it down. And so we're, we're all going to die out here. And it's amazing how quickly they seem to fall back into a state of mind where it's like there's just no point in continuing on this. Look at, look at um, chapter 7. Well, it, actually, it's over in this 17th chapter where we hear them crying out again. It says in uh, chapter 17, verse 3, But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and, and livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, What am I to do with these people? They're almost ready to stone me. The Lord answered Moses, Go out in front of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb, strike the rock, and the water will come out of it, and the people will drink. And so Moses did this in the sight of the elders. God provided once again. But here they are with this grumbling. Grumbling again. Grumbling against Moses, ready to stone him to death. It's like we are, they are not really ready to keep going. And their fallback seems to forever be this thing of, we were better off in Egypt. Why did we go off on this trip with you? And so the sea stops them from doing it, but in their hearts, they keep wanting to fall back. In their hearts, they keep releasing their grip on the things that God is working in their lives. And, and, and I just see so many people who, who live with that kind of tentative commitment with God. And so that even when his blessings are there, they don't really receive them in a way that brings real joy to life and peace and contentment. It doesn't rise up in them in gratitude to say, wow, God is so awesome. And hold on to them in a way that says, and I'm ready to trust him tomorrow whenever it's not all there. You see, there's so, so many people that in the midst of God's faithfulness, we turn into these grumblers who just let go and say, well, I just don't know. Maybe I just need to go back on my own instead of trusting God. And so they lose and they let go of the, the hope that God has given to them. It's like all the distance that God has brought them all of a sudden doesn't mean a thing. All the blessings that God has prepared along the way, it's all just left out of their hands. So instead of living with peace and contentment, with a solid sense of the presence of God in their lives, they just fall into this frantic state, constantly waffling, constantly considering quitting. Do you find yourself like that? I tell you what, all of us have that natural will to either fight or, fl or flight. That natural response to things. Something startles you, you either put your fists up or you put your hands up like that. But those are the two things that we do. And there are many times that people just want to run away and say, I'm just going to go back to where I came. Or they turn into these fighters, but fight the wrong battle. Here they are turning around ready to beat Moses up. Moses is like, man, these people are ready to stone me to death. We just we turn into these people who rage against God and have this fight in us that says, God, you've really let me down. Where, where we need to come to in our lives and what God is working to bring in us is a, is a confidence in his word, his promise for us. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, it says that uh, the Lord is give, giving, giving the people his commands and, and he says, now be careful to follow every command I am giving you today so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the Lord promises on oath to your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you hunger to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, 
to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? You remember that line. Jesus quoted this, remember? In the Gospels, when Jesus fasted and then was tempted by the devil, and the devil said to him, why don't you use your power and turn these stones into bread? And Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now you know where he was quoting that from. And now you see the connection of all this. God was working in the lives of his people so that instead of trusting in bread, they would trust in him. That they would trust that God's word was good, that his promise was true, that they could rely on him, and that it was not bread, but it was every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's a life that is fully bought in, that is fully surrendered, that is fully trusting and confident that my life has to be led by, shaped by, and provided for by God. And that, and that you are willing to put your life fully into his hands every step along the way. So instead of this tentative commitment that says, if it's going good, I'm in. If it's not going good, I'm out. It's a full in commitment that says in lean times or in abundance, I'm in. I'm trusting in you, Lord. God has to work to build that up in our lives. And that's why God's faithfulness is there even when we are foolish. Even when we express our grumbling, our complaining, and we pull back from God instead of moving forward faithfully. God is persisting because he is seeking to reach you and me with his promise and to prove that he can be counted on. But this is, this is hard for us to get a hold of, hard for us to do if we don't make that surrender to God. It's, in fact, impossible. In the New Testament, uh, again, in John's, in John's Gospel, in the sixth chapter, there's, uh, this is just an incredible chapter. And you remember that our key verses for the words of life pursuit come from this chapter. Verses 68 and 69 that Jesus asked the disciples if they were going to leave him. And Peter responded, where would we go? You have the words of life. And we are convinced and believe that you are the Holy One of God. That's a resolve that says, I don't know what's coming next, and I don't know where, the, where things are going, and I don't know where all these other people are going, but God, I'm in. Jesus, you're it. I have no place else to go, no one else that I'm going to turn to, I'm in. That's where that chapter ends up with Peter making that declaration in response to Jesus' question. But how did it get there? It's interesting, this chapter points us back to manna once again. Jesus had been performing miracles, healing the sick, doing all kinds of miraculous wonders before people, and they came out to him then in droves. And then came this moment when in, in the sixth chapter he, he fed thousands with just a few loaves and fishes. Then in verse 25 it says that, that Jesus in the night he crossed over the lake and people pursued him. And get this, it says that when they found him on the other side of the lake they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, the original miracles that they had chased after him for, but he says, now it's because you ate the loaves and had your fill. He says, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. And they asked him, well, what must we do to do the works God requires? Sounds like a good question. But their hearts are not really in it. Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, what sign will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our, our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness. Oh, man. What up with this? What is up with this? They said, what is it that God requires of us? Well, he says, believe in the one that he has sent. Well, what sign would you give us to prove that you're the one? They've seen him doing miracles. They followed him because he was doing miracles. He fed them with a miracle. 
And now whenever he says to them, the, the thing that you need to do is to believe the one that the Father has sent you. They say, well, what sign will you give us? What sign? Do they care about a sign? No. What sign do they request? What sign? Manna. What did Jesus say they were following for? Food. He had them pegged perfectly. They were in for the, for the lunch. They were in for free food. They were in to follow a guy who would keep providing for them like that. They followed after him. And so were they really interested in following him? No. They were interested in a free meal. They were interested in what blessing will we get from you today? And so that this is where then things begin to unravel with this crowd of people that are following after Jesus. Many of them seeming very serious. I mean, hey, come on. They got up and left whatever they were doing and followed him way out into the sticks to the point that Jesus had said, these people are so far out here in the middle of nowhere, they don't have food, we got to feed them. Or they're going to faint on their way back. We've got to take care of them out here. That was the whole point of that. They had followed him all the way out there. They seemed so serious and so dedicated, don't they? Until Jesus throws down the real challenge. And the real challenge is, will you take me and me alone? To be the feed, the feeding, and the uh, substance to feed you and to fuel you in your life. Will you take me and me alone to believe in and to hope in? They get into this whole discussion that follows where Jesus tells them, I'm the bread of heaven that's come down to you. And they press him further on it. And ultimately, Jesus makes this, this uh, statement that to them sounds so repugnant and disgusting. He says, Listen, you're going to have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. That's what I give you. I give you nothing but me. That's it. You'll have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. They hear that and say, you're disgusting. You're gross. This is so off. You can't eat somebody else's flesh. That's, that's against the, the law. That's not right. This becomes the reason that they can say, forget you. This is... This isn't, this isn't right. This isn't what I was looking for. This isn't what I was here for. Makes us ask ourselves, what is it then that we are looking for? What is it that we are in pursuit of with God? Are we, like them, looking for another sandwich, a free meal? Are we in whenever it seems as if everything is going our way? Are we ready when God is providing blessing upon blessing? And then whenever he says, all that I'm going to give you today is me, my word for you. I'm going to promise you that I will be with you. I will sustain you through this hardship. I will carry you through it. Even through the valley of the shadow of death, I will be with you and I will give you life. Those who believe in me, though they die, yet shall they live, Jesus said. He is asking you and me, are you really in it? Or are you just going through the motions? Are you just on for, uh, along for the ride? Are you only going out the gate and then you're going to peel off somewhere else? Are you only here while things are are coming up the way that you expected, and then you're done and ready to retreat all the way back to give it all up and say, I'm over it. You see, the Lord is calling on you and me to be in this place where ultimately Peter declared it. Because people started to leave Jesus, and he turned to his disciples and said, are you going to leave too? Are you going to quit too? Are you here just for the sandwich? Are you here just for the good times? Are you here just on the days whenever, I ha whenever it appears as if I have everything in under control? Or, 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 and whenever things seem to be unraveling in the world around you, you're done, you're quitting, you're frantic, you're fuming, you're done trusting at that point? Is that where you are? Is that where your faith is this morning? Jesus says, come on. What I want you to do is come and follow me. Jesus says, I want to give you something that will last. And he said, that's not this bread. It's this bread. The bread that comes down from heaven to you. 
I want to give you myself. And I want you to be able to trust me because I am the one thing that will last forever. That's what will feed your soul and make it last. Our youngsters are coming in to join us as we would share communion this morning. And so I want to invite you to receive them, uh, the families to receive them, and, and I want to invite you then to collect your communion elements in hand. You can open the side that has the bread in it. Be able to take that in hand. You know, in that 16th, 17th chapter where things transpire with, in Exodus with the people, two things they're missing. One is food. Did that the last time. One is food, basic element of life. The other is water, something to drink. And Jesus offers us up himself to be those basic elements of life to say trust me in this take me in life I'm the bread from heaven that's come down to you in the upper room when he sat down with his disciples he took the same images that he had offered up to the crowd and he offered it up to them to say I want you to eat my flesh and drink my blood but he wasn't inviting them to some kind of weird cannibalism. He's saying, I want you to buy in completely to what I am doing for you. My body will be broken on a cross and my blood will be shed there. I'm asking you to trust me so completely that, that whatever else it costs, whatever else you might lose, that you're willing to be satisfied with me. That you're willing to trust me to provide and to have an answer. You're willing to put your life into my hands as if I am the bread of life for you. That I'm going to feed and care for you completely. So he offered it up to the disciples saying, take this, this is, this is my body. The bread that I give to you to eat. Almighty God, I pray that you would bless this bread that we take this morning. Knowing that it speaks to us your goodness, your sacrifice, and calls us to a faith that would surrender our whole life into your hands. To know that even when we're working a job, we're not independently wealthy. We're not independently sustained. We are still dependent on you every single day, for every breath, for every step. And so for you, Lord, who sustains us, not only by giving us bread to feed our bodies, but a purpose to live our lives. You are the bread of heaven. And so, Lord, we take this bread and pray that you would bear witness to us and that we might bear witness to you of love and of faith and of hope. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Take and eat this bread, remembrance of Christ. Now you can open the other side. And just as Jesus offers up bread to say, here's a basic element of life, having water, that fluid of refreshment to our bodies is so completely vital that we can't live without, but we cannot live without, likewise, what he has given to us with his blood, a sustaining of our lives with cleansing, to purify us, to make us holy, to let us live our lives clean, free in Christ Jesus. Lord, we pray that as we take this cup and drink it, that we would drink in the cleansing grace of Jesus and have confidence and peace that you, O Lord, forgive us and that we are clean. That you, Lord, would sustain us with a refreshing, O God, that keeps us moving 
flowing, God, and the moving of your Holy Spirit day in and day out. So that, Lord, you could lead us, shape us after your will, so that in all things we would be holy. That our lives, shaped by your moving of, the, of your Holy Spirit, would make us holy, holy indeed, with purity and whole, that we would be entirely yours. So bless this cup, O oh God, as we share it together. Bless it, Lord, to pour into us your grace, your Holy Spirit, the witness, O oh God, of your cleansing power. And Lord, let us drink it in as souls who would lap up, O oh God, this precious gift with a hunger and, a, and yet with a deep satisfaction that comes from you. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Take and drink this cup, Jesus said, for in it is the blood of a new covenant, a promise and a direction for your life. Jesus, as you come to lead us to close, I'm going to invite us all to stand and to pray together the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I want you to remember uh, one another in prayer this week and continue to lift up our, uh, our nation, our church, our family, and uh, people around you, just in general to lift one another up. But then also remember those that we mentioned earlier. I could also mention many more, like Patty Gehring lost her mother this past week and lift her in grief. And, and uh, uh, Linda Holtz, I prayed with this morning, is having some surgery on an internal hernia this week and uh, we're very hopeful for that to provide some relief, relief and blessing and, and I'm sure there are others amongst us. So don't forget also that out on the welcome desk there are green cards about like that that uh, you can pick up and note if you have a prayer need that you'd like to either be passed along just to me or turned in to go out on our prayer list on Monday mornings. We email out a prayer list and if you're not receiving that you can sign up for that with that card as well. Because we want to keep each other lifted up in prayer all the way through. We as a nation need it. We as the church need it. And we as individuals need it. So let's bow in prayer. Father, thank you once again for your blessing that you love us. I'm thankful, God, for every time that I've taken a foolish step. 
been doubtful, pushed back against your will, that you have been so faithful. Thanking you, God, today is, is just, you know, one way of expressing that. But God, we want to be more than people who just give lip service. We want to be people who will take the steps in our everyday lives to make sure that we're following you and that our whole life is designed around following you. And that there we can build a hope, a confidence, and a peace, God, that would free us from the worrisome grumblers who are always ready to quit. And instead, God, equip us to live fervently, joyfully, peace at peace with you. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Peace of the Lord be with you. Amen.